Loretta Saunders was a 26-year-old Inuk woman and university student in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. She was studying criminology at St. Mary's University and was researching the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women for her thesis. Tragically, little did she know that her academic pursuits would tragically intersect with her personal life. Loretta Saunders, born on June 26, 1988, was a proud Inuk woman from Labrador, Newfoundland, Canada. Growing up within the tight-knit Inuit family of Nunatukavit, Loretta had a deep connection to her cultural roots. Raised alongside seven siblings, her family life was marked by both love and hardship. According to her sister Delilah, the Saunders family, like many indigenous families, faced challenges including experiences of physical and sexual abuse, as well as issues related to children and a lack of educational opportunities. Loretta Saunders faced significant challenges in her life, including severe drug addiction, which led her to experience periods of homelessness. Despite these struggles, Loretta was determined to overcome her addiction and build a better life for herself. She started on a methadone treatment program, once she got her life on track, she applied to St. Mary University in Halifax to study criminology and advocacy. She was accepted and was very happy about it. As she was actively engaged in advocating for the rights and well-being of indigenous people, particularly women, her aspirations was to create positive change within her community. She found solace and happiness in her relationship with Yalchin Sorkolte. The couple shared a strong bond built on love, support, and understanding. Their relationship, which had blossomed over three years, was a source of joy and stability in Loretta's life. In a beautiful turn of events, Loretta discovered that she was pregnant, marking a new chapter in their lives. The news filled her with excitement and anticipation as she looked forward to becoming a mother and welcoming their first child into the world. Loretta Saunders, in preparation for the new chapter in her life, moved in with Yalson at his home. To make some extra money, she decided to sublet her apartment. On February 14, 2014, Yalson became deeply concerned about Loretta Saunders. Not having seen her since the previous day, he grew increasingly worried when he received a text message from Loretta explaining her stressed work situation and mentioning that she would be staying with a friend. This departure from her usual communication style left Yalson anxious and unable to reach her. Knowing that it was highly unusual for Loretta not to provide more details about where she was staying, Yalson's panic intensified. Yalchin's increasing worry prompted him to reach out to Loretta's sister, Delilah, in the hope of gaining any information about Loretta's whereabouts. However, even Delilah was unaware of her sister's current location. Concern quickly spread to Loretta's parents as they realized that all of her belongings were still at home, except for her missing car. After three agonizing days of Loretta's absence, her worried loved ones took the distressing step of reporting her as missing to the police. Yalson, deeply concerned for her well-being, informed the authorities that Loretta had left the house on the 13th of February, engaged in several tasks throughout the day, starting with collecting rent for the sublet apartment. When the police conducted a search of Yalson's house, they found nothing to suggest his involvement in Loretta's disappearance. Confident that he was the last person to have seen her and recognizing him as a concerned partner, the police ruled him out as a potential suspect. The police, in their quest for answers, initiated their investigation by visiting the building where Loretta had sublet her apartment. CCTV footage revealed Loretta entering the building but curiously, there was no footage of her leaving. When they inspected the apartment, everything appeared to be in order and surprisingly neat. During the course of their inquiries, the police learned about another couple that had been residing in Loretta's apartment. 
To their surprise, this couple had also disappeared. The couple connected to Loretta's sublet apartment was identified as Victoria Henneberry and Blake Leggett. Loretta had sublet her apartment to them after they responded to an online advertisement. A plea for help from a distraught sister. She's so smart and she is, she is my world. She's my everything. The story of Loretta Saunders is one of eerie coincidence. A Nanook preparing her honors thesis on missing and murdered Aboriginal women. There are now fears she's joined the ranks. A young woman going to university that was in contact with her family every single day until February 13th. And since then, there hasn't been any contact. The investigation took a significant turn when investigators discovered that Loretta's bank card had been used multiple times after her disappearance. This unexpected development injected a glimmer of hope into the hearts of Loretta's family, suggesting the possibility that she might still be alive. On February 13th, the day when Loretta was last seen, her card was used on the store. The footage showed her car parked outside of the store around 5 p.m. But the woman that used the card did not look like Loretta. The same day, her card was used again at the Tim Hortons. It can be seen that the woman was sitting on the passenger seat. The person driving the car was not Loretta either. It was a male. A significant breakthrough occurred when the Halifax police received a call from another police station indicating that Loretta Saunders' car had been located parked outside someone's house in Harrow, Ontario, miles away from where she was last seen. And the house was of none other than Victoria Henneberry and Blake Leggett. Her car was found at this home in Harrow, Ontario. Her two new roommates, Victoria Henneberry and Blake Leggett, were charged with stealing Saunders' vehicle and improper use of her bank card. The couple told police that Loretta had sold her car to them, and it was cheaper for them to drive than to take a flight to Ontario. However, investigators were not convinced as they found Loretta's phone and bank card at their residence. They decided to review the footage of the day Loretta was disappeared. Around 2 p.m., Blake was seen carrying a considerably large and heavy hockey bag. After taking the bag outside, he returned and carried out some more bags. This time, it was his third and final time, and this time he was accompanied by Victoria. Investigators now knew that their chance to find Loretta alive was little to none, as it was very likely that she would be inside one of those bags. Neither Victoria nor Blake were forthcoming with information. However, a breakthrough occurred when the police seized Blake's phone and uncovered a significant discovery. On the device, they found a video recording from a couple of days prior to Loretta's disappearance, capturing an argument between the couple. Are you hungry? Stop it! Are you hungry? Wait for me. Are you hungry? You can't even say that you really want to kill Loretta. Really? And you said that you want to kill her earlier. When did I you? say that? I don't lie about who I want to kill, and maybe you should stop lying. Who do you want to kill then? You're the one who says. You. Oh, I want to you kill just. Loretta. You. I you. You just said. You're, okay, the... Detectives knew it would be easier to break Victoria, so they pressured her into speaking the truth. Soon, Victoria confessed that Blake killed her by smothering her with a bag, all that to avoid paying rent. It came to light that Loretta had enough, 
and she was asking them to move out of her apartment as they were not paying rent. Victoria lead investigators to Loretta's remains. About 300 miles away, her body was found. Exactly two weeks ago, Loretta Saunders, a 26-year-old Halifax University student, vanished. An incredible volunteer effort mobilized to try to find her, to bring this woman home safely. And as one Aboriginal leader put it last night after it was discovered that her body was found and that this was a homicide case, People were just so incredibly saddened. People had stepped up and fallen in love with this woman. She was still in the same hockey bag that was seen on the CCTV footage. An autopsy confirmed that she had been strangled to death. More than 200 people filled the hall at St. Mary's University. There wasn't an empty chair to be found at the memorial for Loretta Saunders. And we're here to honor her, remember her, respect her. The death of a soon-to-be graduate has had a profound impact. Your life was very, was truly precious. We all miss your glamour and cheer. Know that you will never be forgotten. I know your spirit still lingers here. The president of St. Mary's says if the family agrees, a scholarship will be named in Loretta's memory. The family will get to say goodbye to their girl tomorrow. A funeral for Loretta is planned for Goose Bay, Labrador. As the trial started, the truth had finally came out. The shocking details of Loretta Saunders' tragic fate emerged as both Victoria and Blake provided their accounts of the horrifying events. According to their chilling narratives, Loretta had sat down on a chair, expecting to receive the rent. In a sudden and brutal turn, Blake approached her from behind, initiating a vicious attack by choking her with a plastic bag. Loretta, displaying immense resilience, fought fiercely, breaking all four plastic bags. Despite her courageous struggle, Blake overpowered her, repeatedly hitting her head against the ground until she stopped moving. The couple callously placed Loretta's lifeless body in a hockey bag and left the apartment as if nothing had happened. Shockingly, they proceeded to use Loretta's credit card for shopping, displaying a complete lack of remorse for their heinous actions. In the aftermath of the horrific crime, Blake pleaded guilty and received a life sentence in prison without the chance of parole for 25 years. Meanwhile, Victoria, who also pleaded guilty, was sentenced to life in prison, but with the possibility of applying for parole after 10 years. This sentencing decision sparked controversy, especially among Loretta's family, who found it difficult to accept the relatively shorter potential parole period for Victoria. And she got 10 years. Now what kind of justice is that? You tell me what kind of justice. A pregnant woman, a small little pregnant woman, two big monsters. And you know, they say, they give us justice, 10 years. Is that justice? Anybody? Pregnant women, murdered, two murderers. I like to see the. La uh, I would like to see the death penalty come in. I would like to see the death penalty and cold-blooded murderers be taken off this street once and for all. They haven't got a right to breathe the air what we breathe because they took the life of my daughter and my grandchild. They murdered her without mercy. And I think we should have no mercy on them. As I walked down to the courthouse, I, deep down in my heart, I was, I was praying and I was saying, God, if you're real, I'm sorry if, to be questioning you. If you're real, God, and you really have my daughter with you, please ask them to plead guilty. And it was so funny. Then I would say, oh my God, what's that? You know, I was talking to God. And you know, God answered my prayer. and. The, all the prayers, the people, supporters who've been praying for us all through, our prayers was answered, and I like to thank everybody. I'm so mixed feeling, I'm hurting. 
I'm, I'm going to miss my girl. I'm glad that we don't have to go through what we had to do. And I'm feeling bad for their parents. It's, I don't know. I'm overwhelmed. I'm really overwhelmed. The documentary aims to honor Loretta's memory, shed light on the complexities of her case, and spark conversations about the broader challenges that demand our attention and collective action.